And so now I believe um, Judge Katz is going to share with us um, her experiences um, and some insight into juvenile court, child welfare, and CASA's role. So um, as is my proclivity, I'm, I'm gonna lecture a little bit at you and, and please forgive me. Um, I just think that there, I think back to how little I knew when I became DCF commissioner. And uh, when I was on the Supreme Court, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I am happy to say I wrote hundreds of opinions and sat on thousands of panels, but what I really knew about DCF, um, I mean, I won't say I, it could be limited to an index card, certainly not. Um, and I wrote some seminal cases on the structure of the statutory scheme and some of the constitutional rights at play. But, you know, knowing something uh, through the lens of, um, a judge or a justice and analyzing statutes very different than the role that I took on as commissioner and coming to learn uh, about the, the, what I will call the human factor and the kinds of things that, that these children experience. Um, I said at the time I was the uh, statutory guardian of 4,500 children at one point and certainly responsible for probably about 16,000 um, but there is, there is no substitute for digging into files and, um, and frankly, having meeting, meeting our children. And um, I had one of the highlights um, that I experienced was I had dinner every couple of months with uh, teenage foster youth. And, um, and if you know teenagers, they will tell you everything you are doing wrong. Uh, they are not shy. And, um, and they are powerful. And frankly, I thought my role was to empower them. And so they wrote the Foster Care Bill of Rights, the Sibling Bill of Rights. I would give them homework assignments and, um, and really tried to empower them to feel that they had some control over their destiny and that their lives were not going to be defined by the things that happened to them. So, but I do want to just talk to you very briefly about some of the, uh, the effects and, and traumatic effects that our children experience and that you will encounter uh, if you haven't already. And I think it's just a, an eye opener. And so bear with me. Um, I have some extensive notes and I will try and do the Reader's Digest abridged version uh, to just touch base, uh, touch on a, a number of the issues. Obviously the first and foremost is trauma. Uh, and all of the children who have, uh, who, have come to the attention of DCF, virtually all, have really in, in one way or another been traumatized. And I think we need to understand it's not just a term uh, it, and it's not just a psychological issue. It's um, trauma really disrupts the processing uh, and the processes and structures essential to optimal child development, uh, both neurobiological, intrapsychic structures endure abuse that can lead to chronic disorders. And within the family, exposure to the uncontrollable stress of violence, family disruption, uh, drug uh, abuse, which I'll get into, all of these things create a sense of helplessness and really hopelessness. And so part of what you, what you will do and what you will experience is the whole concept of advocating for necessary medical and, and mental health both diagnosis, services as well, obviously. And I think those things are a major component uh, to what it means to represent traumatized children. In addition, uh, educated, let's, let's be very clear, securing an appropriate educational plan, which will then also take into consideration the child's particular circumstances. And that will also be very key to the child's um, continuing development. Some of the uh, traumatic effects that you may experience or you may witness, I should say, um, physical, obviously there could be an immune system weakening as a consequence of that, emotional, difficulty identifying, expressing, managing emotions, depression, anxiety, anger, appearing numb to emotions, uh, behavior, struggle with self-regulation, lack of impulse control, ability to think through consequences before acting, cognition, uh, our children may have trouble with thinking clearly, reasoning, problem solving, uh, self-concept. They may indeed feel worthless and despondent. And finally, uh, attachment. 
trauma can interfere with the child's ability to develop a healthy and secure attachment to, to his or her caregivers. Um, and, and quite frankly, the alternative is also very possible. A child can become overly clingy uh, to a caregiver. The next uh, subject that I'd want to just touch on, and I, I don't mean to uh, beat you all over the heads. Um, I just think that it's, it's important to recognize that these, these are some of the considerations that you will be faced and, um, and faced with dealing with. Um, so when we talk about family breakup and conflict, uh, there really is a, uh, a large body of research that's clearly documented that many children are negatively affected by their parents' divorce, um, at least in the short term. So uh, obviously negative effects of divorce can also be seen over the long term. Uh, many children continue experiencing um, their parents' divorce as a negative influence in their lives through adolescence and, and into adulthood. And their energy can be invested in this conflict, which means um, they have less energy to invest in their own development. And children, whether it's divorce or in some other high conflict situation, children whose parents experience that are more likely to experience behavioral um, and academic problems, including but not limited to disobedience, aggression, delinquency, poor self-esteem, um, antisocial behaviors, and depression. And it's often the prolonged process of change and adaptation uh, that negatively affect children, which is then, of course, only exacerbated if the parents themselves can't navigate the process in a healthy way. And so what, uh, what contributes to psychological vulnerability for an individual child is not an isolated event or a stressor, but is rather an aggregated accumulation of events. Ongoing parental conflict, weak parent-child relationships, the parents remarriage, these are all among the sources of stress that have been identified as being important to understanding children's adjustments. Uh, teens, not only do they struggle equally, I, I would suggest in some instances they struggle uh, more, but certainly differently through the process. Um, they can be accelerated into adulthood at a time when they should be slowly moving towards maturity. They oftentimes become um, parentified. They take on the role of the parent or the best friend to their own parent. They take on the role of parent to younger siblings. And so again, if you are dealing with teenagers, um, you need to be aware of what, what representing teens and working with teens is really um, what it's about. And oftentimes their reactions will be extreme. This uh, can lead obviously to behaviors that, that may then cause them to harm themselves in irreparable ways. Uh, teens may turn inward, they may become depressed, and in fact, they may even become suicidal. And while, um, while support from teens is essential to teen development, they are particularly vulnerable, vulnerable to navigating uh, peer influences during these times. And of course, Teens today are exposed to the whole internet, World Wide Web. And so it may, it doesn't, as we all know, doesn't need to be um, in their face and verbal, it, but it, it's insidious and it can creep into, uh, into their bedrooms in the middle of the night, unbeknownst to anybody and, um, and really have very, very significant uh, negative influence. And some of these teens dive into premature, unhealthy sexual behavior. Some take on drug use, some take on criminal activity, and needless to say, all of which uh, may result in negative consequences that can be long lasting. What, um, what else do teens experience that you may need to be uh, acquainted with? Um, and that's just not just teens, uh, and that would be domestic violence. The intricacies of families experiencing domestic violence are too many and too specialized to cover completely at this point, but, um, but I, I just wanna highlight a couple of, of things when we talk about domestic violence. Um, it's real, it's not always obvious, and the proof may not always be in forms of bruises, uh, pictures, police reports. Uh, it, it's again, um, it's not always physical. Now, physical aggression, such as hitting other forms of physical force, obviously fall under this category, but quite frankly, so sort of stalking, 
intimidation, isolated behavior, um, controlling behavior, other forms uh, of coercive control. So if you're in juvenile court and you're dealing with a family that's experiencing domestic violence, then again, it's likely that one of the factors identified as the basis uh, for the petition that's been filed is something uh, that you may then be experiencing and it'll be the basis for the petition that's been filed against the parents, one of the parents. A um, couple of other things I just wanna touch on uh, in this regard, um, it's always relevant. Domestic violence is always relevant in cases involving children, regardless of whether the children have been the victim, whether they're a witness or consciously unaware of the violence. Even when children, and this is hard to, to appreciate, but I understand, um, even when children are not directly targeted, exposure to domestic violence in the home can contribute contribute to behavioral, social, and emotional problems. And as is true with most things, not all children exposed to domestic violence are affected the same way. Uh, they can react differently, but exposure nonetheless is traumatic. And frankly, uh, merely ex being exposed, not being the direct victim, will nevertheless evoke the same effects as other traumatic events. Uh, poor school performance, impaired ability to concentrate, uh, lower scores on measures of verbal, motor, social skills. Um, and when addressing domestic violence, it's, it's um, among everything else you're gonna be dealing with, it's challenging to figure out a way to keep your child, um, the child you're working with safe while keeping them connected to the primary caregiver. And, and mostly more often than not, the primary caregiver is the non-defending parent, but, um, but not always. Domestic violence does not, uh, I wanna highlight, it does not have to meet the standards set out in criminal statutes to be relevant in a child protection or a family court case. Uh, there is often criminal overlap, criminal court overlap and violence has occurred, but it, it doesn't have to be. Uh, and this could mean that the family you're working with is subject to criminal protective order, which obviously um, is something to take into account and be aware of. And it's important that you consider this when, um, when contemplating, I think, some of the parenting plans, some of the services that are available, and, and some of your interaction with the children. You may, be the, um, you may be the only place where the child feels safe and um, the only person who doesn't want something from this child, frankly. The last thing I want to highlight is, um, or, or address is incarceration. We have the highest incarceration rate in the world. Uh, about some of my stats are not the most recent, but going back to even 2015, we had 2.1 million people in, in our nation's prisons. That's 700 per, per 100,000 people. And parental incarceration is a risk factor also to be considered in both family and juvenile court cases. Um, because of the overlapping risk factors involved in most cases, it's difficult to determine what the direct impact uh, that parental incarceration alone may have um, and has on, uh, on outcomes for children. But uh, clearly, when a parent is incarcerated, your the child you're working with may be susceptible to a greater incidence of health and behavioral problems. They may experience homelessness, um, maternal neglect, paternal neglect, anxiety, learning disabilities, developmental delays, and this is just to name a few things. Um, the, the disruption of family relationships obviously impact the, the children you're working with. Incarcerated parents have a limited capability to work towards reunification with their children for obvious reasons. And incarceration, again, for obvious reasons, interferes with uh, the parent's ability to maintain an attachment to the child. Child's ability to maintain ties to that parent is, um, is important. It's crucial uh, to helping the child deal with the separation in a healthy way, particularly if that parent was a primary caregiver for the child before incarceration. Uh, in the juvenile court context, uh, unless the court has released DCF from the responsibility of making reasonable efforts to unify 
or has determined that visiting and, and contact with the incarcerated parent puts the child in danger, uh, you should expect and frankly advocate for child-centered services that would allow the incarcerated parent to interact in a positive way with the child um, in a structured environment, certainly. And increasing research and um, policy demonstrate that shared interests of corrections and child welfare joining forces to maximize opportunities for assisting children and families, something to, to be mindful of. And strong family relationships uh, are obvious uh, with regard to motivating inmates to participate in effective programs and to maintain good behavior. And visitation uh, will allow the children to express their emotional reactions to the separation and frankly will help them develop a more realistic understanding of their parents' circumstances. Um, I thought I had said that was the last thing. No, actually there is one other big factor um, that I'd like to highlight and that's substance abuse and substance use actually. And Judge Westbrook had identified it early on in her remarks. Um, family life for children with one or both parents uh, who abuse drugs or alcohol can often be incredibly chaotic and unpredictable. Um, now, not all children whose parents suffer from substance use disorder will experience abuse or neglect, but they're certainly at increased risk for maltreatment and entering the child welfare system. Once a report has been substantiated, children of parents with substance use issues are more likely to be placed in out of home care uh, and more likely to stay in care longer than other children. Substance use is, is probably the, um, the issue that is the least predictable and the longest uh, to, to really remediate. Identifying substance use and meeting the needs of parents with substance use disorders um, and their children is, to say it's a challenge is an understatement. Uh, not only finding appropriate services, but also because substance use many times will stem from co-occurring underlying issues such as PTSD, poverty, domestic violence, uh, mental illness, and social isolation. And also it's important to know that um, relapse is part of recovery. Uh, when it comes to caring for a child, the parent's substance use disorder can affect parenting and child development in lots of ways. Uh, the parent can have physical and mental impairments caused by substance use. They can have uh, lower capacity to respond to a child's needs. They can have difficulty controlling anger, impulsivity, um, and it also can result in incarceration. There may, may be many disruptions uh, in parent-child attachment and the use of Limited funds on alcohols and drugs rather than household needs is also something that's um, often an obvious uh, collateral effect. Uh, children whose parents suffer from substance use disorders are more likely to have attachment disorders um, and all of the social and emotional difficulties associated with that. Uh, and then also finally, they are at increased risk themselves of developing a substance use problem. Uh, and clearly each family, each family member is uniquely affected by the parent's substance use. Uh, therefore, treating only the individual with the current substance use issue is not generally fully effective. Um, if a parent uses a legal substance recreationally, it's not likely that that in and of itself is gonna pose a real danger uh, to the um, in family court. But again, if there's an allegation that the substance use uh, has put the child in danger as a result of harmful or neglectful behavior on the part of the parent, then it will be part of your role in working with this child to determine whether or not the concern is valid, um, whether use of illegal substance, whether categorized or recreational or not, will likely demand, frankly, some level of investigation. Um, and a critical challenge for child welfare professionals is finally uh, is meeting legislative requirements around issues of permanency. That's a whole other conversation. Um, and it, it's a real challenge when you're dealing with a substance use issue because there has to be sufficient progress on the substance use side, but yet you're, you're up against the clock uh, that the Adoption and Safe Families Act has imposed. So that's a challenge. And um, again, all other subject for conversation, but I, I thought it was important to, to identify it as, um, as a concern, a consideration, and particularly in the context of substance use. 
So I just throw a lot at everybody. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying not to scare people, but I think it's really important that you understand how, uh, how important your role is uh, to, to help the children with whom you're working and, uh, and to be on their side. So thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful overview of so many of the crucial considerations um, for our volunteers working with the families in the in the juvenile court. So 